Hey everybody, welcome to GMG Review. Today we're taking a look at Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team 2024 Mandrakes. The data cards uh, for the second of the two Eldari Kill Teams brought in as Legacy Kill Teams in this first wave of data cards. For the 2024 edition of uh, Warhammer 40K's Skirmish Mode. Now these were released during the Beta Decima series. This is the previous to this edition of Kill Team. Not really edition, but like wave of Kill Team stuff. Um, and were released, I think, with the Scouts, he said, question mark? No, that was the Aspect Warriors. These ones were in actually with the uh, my second favorite of all time, the Night Lords. It was spooky against spooky in this box set. Um, and these were kindly sent as a complimentary review copy by Games Workshop and are basically a in uh, tarot-sized card format version of these dossiers, uh, which are in the new box set. So. You get all the same information, it's just laid out in these handy cards. And I'll be honest, I missed having these cards when I had to play out of this book. It was way easier to play with the card set and just have the information I needed in front of me as opposed to flipping back and forth through rulebook pages. I really hope they, at some point, release a data card set for the Hivestorm teams because it was just super handy. And as we go forward with this edition, if it's anything like Beta Decima and Galadark Previous, we're gonna get these um, two-player battle boxes where you get two more kill teams. I'm hoping they come with cards too. Just fingers crossed, they're super handy. Um, it's a nice way of doing the legacy teams, but I would love to have these as game assets going forward. And I honestly feel less bad um, getting rid of card sets than I do getting rid of books. So like, as, as these additions go on, I'm not gonna feel so bad. Like if, if they replace this approved ops card deck next year in 2025, I'm not gonna care. <laughs> I'm just gonna get rid of the cards and get new ones. Um, now, if you are playing Approved Ops, uh, on your Kill Team card, you get your Selection Sheet, but you also get your different archetypes you can play with for Tac Ops in this card set for Infiltration and Recon. So you're trying to like do the spooky place and confirm kills and stuff like that in this one. Uh, you get a Night Fiend, you get eight Mandrakes chosen from the following list, either Warriors, of which you can have as many as you want, and the Four Specialists, which is the Abyssal, the Chooser of the Flesh, the Dirge Maw, and the Shade Weaver. They all have names like they're some kind of Cenobite and Hellraiser, which I think is very funny. Um, then we have our faction rules. These guys have quite a few. The first one is Within Shadow. So an operative with the Within Shadow rule is if any of the following are true. If it's within one of a heavy train piece that's not lower than it, so if it's not standing on top of it, if it's next to it, any part of its base is underneath vantage terrain. So if you're under a vantage point, so like you're under the lip of like a, a platform, um, a shadow portal marker is within its control range. So the Shade Weaver can actually drop out these like umbral portals that allow you to be hidden from it. So that's, that's a key thing, is you are said to be within shadow. And then umbral entities, uh, whenever an operative is shooting a friendly Mandrake operative, ignore the piercing weapon rule all the time. So you just can't have piercing. So you always roll three defense dice. And whenever a friendly Mandrake operative is within shadow, improve its save by one. So you can have four plus saves as long as you're within shadow. And you just ignore piercing, period, because you're made out of shadows. Um, soul strike. Some weapons on the team's rules have the following ability, and it was just easier to print it here than have it everywhere. Soul Strike, each successful defense dice um, is determined differently. Each result that's equal to or less than the target's APL stats is success and is retained. So most people are saving on a one or a two. Each result that's higher is a fail and is discarded. Each result of one is always a crit. Um, each other success is always a normal success. Everything else that's a six is always a fail. So if you're a three APL like character, like a space marine, a one, two, three will pass, a one's a crit. It's almost like they've, they've just ignore armor completely and they reach inside your chest, Kali Ma style, and pull out your uh, heart. Uh, designers note, many of this Kill Team's rules refer to an enemy's operative's APL stat. This would be the APL stat at the time where the rule takes effect, including changes. So if you get stun grenaded and your APL goes down to one or two, that affects your save against all the Shadow Strike stuff. And then finally, Shadow Passage. Mandrakes can slip into the slightest patch of shadow. Once per turning point, one friendly Mandrake operative can use a Shadow Passage when it performs a reposition action, so when you're making a move. If it does, don't move it. Instead, remove it from the um, kill zone and set it up within shadow, so the same as within shadow here. Um, when you set it up, it can't be within control of the enemy. Be a valid target for an enemy operative, so you can't be in line of sight of anybody, or perform a shoot or fight action until the start of the next turning point. So it's like a slip away ability, but it's hugely powerful for pushing buttons. If you want to get to an objective, grab a confirmed kill marker. There's tons of like ability to just pop out from a wall to another wall. And there's no range limit. It's just anywhere in the kill zone. You have an unlimited movement, basically. And in Galadark, that's also super insane. All right, strategic plays, you get four of these. 
Um, after each enemy operative's activation, before the next operative is activated, you can perform a free dash action with one friendly Mandrake operative that has a conceal order if it starts and ends within shadow. You cannot use this ploy during the first turn, and each friendly operative can only be selected by this ploy once per turn. So this is Creeping Horror. It's basically like a free little dash that the rest of them get. It's funny because the Corsair Voids Guard all have a free dash built in their APL. You kind of have to pay for it here, but your unlimited mobility with Shadow Passage makes up for it a little bit. Gloaming Shroud. Whenever an operative is shooting a friendly Mandrake operative that's within shadow, you retain one of your defense dice as a normal save without rolling it, in addition to cover. Blade in the Dark. Each friendly Mandrake operative can perform the charge action while it is a conceal order if it starts or ends its action within shadow. So if you're going along the, the darkness, or you're within one of heavy terrain. An inescapable nightmare. Whenever a friendly Mandrake operative is shooting, fighting, or retaliating, if it's within shadow, you can reroll one of your attack dice. So basically, you want to stay near heavy terrain or underneath uh, vantage points. And as long as you're doing so, all these strategic ploys are going to basically allow you to, to, to do things while you're still concealed and to bamf around a little bit and get some free extra movement. All right, during the firefight phase, these are our four firefight ploys. Slither at a stripe, use this firefight ploy at the end of any operative's activation. Select a friendly Mandrake operative that has an engage order and is within shadow. Change that operative's order to conceal. So this doesn't have to be that Mandrake. It can be anyone's activation. Someone else can turn to conceal afterwards for a CP. Soul Feast. Use this firefight ploy when a friendly Mandrake operative is shooting against, fighting against, or retaliating against an enemy operative within six. At the end of the resolve attack dice step, the friendly operative regains a number of lost wounds equal to the enemy's APL stat. You eat their soul uh, multiplied by the number of your attack dice that inflicted damage during the sequence. So if you take someone from healthy all the way to dead, um, and you did like your base Night Fiend uh, Husk Blades four attacks, and you hit, or five attacks, you hit with like four of them, you might get eight wounds back. You might go from one wound to completely healthy if you manage to hit them that hard. Um, excess dice are ignored. Uh, you cannot play this ploy if a uh, friendly Mandrake operative is incapacitated. So if they're dead during the same turn, then you can't use it at the same time. Nowhere to hide. Use this firefight ploy during a friendly Mandrake operative's activation. When it performs an action in which it moves, until the end of the activation, that operative can move through parts of terrain features as if they were not there, but you must end your move in a location it can be placed. So it's allowing you to basically walk through walls even without access points. And then finally, Shadow's Bite. Use this firefight ploy when an enemy operative performs the fight action in activation in which it performed a charge and selects a friendly Mandrake that's within shadow. Uh, in the resolve attack dice step of the sequence, you resolve the first attack dice. So basically, no matter if you're the attacker or defender, you get to resolve the first one, because you're just that fast. Um, so again, your firefight plays are all about either healing, fighting better, or once again, being within shadow. So heavy terrain is a big key here. And that actually, I'm not gonna review all the universal equipment cards because I did it in the Hivestorm dossier and it's in every single one of these card decks. But this does make certain pieces of, um, of equipment in here, in a, a specifically light barricades and heavy barricades. Uh, if you take barricades, they're not gonna count as shadow, but the heavy barricade does. It's gonna allow you to place a piece of heavy terrain on the game table. It might be worth giving up an equipment point for doing this, or if you're playing in the approved ops card pack, using the equip uh, option in order to take a heavy barricade, just to put another piece of um, heavy terrain out so that you can grab within shadow. Just worth noting that that's you have the ability to place a heavy piece and so much of your stuff goes along shadow, being able to put it in your territory might be handy. All right, then we have our data cards. So the core Mandrake is the Night Fiend, move seven, five plus save, and nine wounds. So tougher than a normal human. Um, he's the, the, the basic, like, or sorry, he's the leader. The basic warrior has eight wounds um, and their seven inch movement is the same as the Eldari Corsair. So they are faster than the average kill team average number of uh, APL, but of course you've got a way of getting free dashes and stuff here with your strategic ploys. And a five plus save will go to a four plus save if you're within shadow. Um, you have a gun, it's called a Bale Blast. It's your little like Hadouken that you have. Four attacks, three plus, three, four damage with soul strike. So it's against your APL for saves. And then a Glimmer Steel Blade. Now this does not of course cause saves because it's a melee attack, lethal five plus, four attacks, three plus, four, five damage. Now your uh, warriors in the new edition tend to get an ability nobody else has because you kind of didn't take them over specialists in the last edition. They're kind of incentivizing you taking them. So Shadow Warrior, whenever this operative is within shadow, add one to the crit damage side of its blade. So it's four, six if it's in shadow. The Night Fiend, the boss, still only two APL, but he has Harrowing Whispers. Whenever your opponent would activate an enemy operative within six of this operative, you can roll 1d6. If it's higher than their APL stat, they can't operate because he freezes them. If there's no other enemy operatives, this roll has no effect. So if it's the last guy to go, then they can't go. But you basically can't operate somebody within six of them unless they can roll under their APL stat. And then Ubli X, whenever this operative is readied, 
um, or if this operative is incapacitating an enemy operative with its husk blade, its oobliex becomes active. Whenever its oobliex is active and an attack dice would inflict damage, roll a d6 on a 5 plus, ignore the damage from the attack dice, and its oobliex is no longer active. So you get a 5 plus save against the damage um, as long as you've killed somebody, and it can keep reactivating too. So there's your warrior and your basic boss with his plus one wound. You have to take the boss, um, and you're going to be you're going to be there's only four specialists. You're going to have at least four warriors, and there's no choices on how you build them. They just have the bale blast and the husk blade. Then we have our specialist. We have the chooser of the flesh. Again, like a nice Cenobite Hellraiser kind of name. Um, same core stats as the warrior. Same bale blast and ba um, and bale blade, except his bale blade is brutal as well as being lethal five plus. So you can only parry it with crits, and he crits on a five. He's got Soul Harvest. Um, whenever an enemy operative is incapacitated as a result of this operative's part collector rule or ba bale blade, um, you gain a Soul Harvest point. Or two, if that enemy operative has an APL stat of three or more, if it's a space marine, it has a tasty soul. Whenever a friendly Mandrake operative is activated, you can spend one of your Soul Harvest points to either add one to its APL stat until the end of the battle, so forever, go to three APL, or have it regain two to three lost wounds. Note you can spend your Soul Harvest points even if this operative is incapacitated. So like, V always take the choose of the flesh. He hands out permanent plus one APL, which is huge, and he's also your medic, so he can heal people. Um, and there's no like restriction for that. It's just you've got the soul points, you spend them when somebody activates now. Uh, and then park collector, whenever an enemy operative would fall back while it's within control range, do 2d3 damage to them before it moves. <laughs> you just rip chunks off of them. Then we have our abyssal. He's got a better shot, so bale surge has a blast ability with blast two, um, or bale surge burn, which has lethal five plus. They're both soul strike. Five dice, three plus, three, four damage. It's like a super bolter that can either lethal five plus or explode. His blade's the same as a warrior's. And then bale fire. Whenever a friendly mandrake operative is shooting an enemy operative that has one or more of your bale fire tokens, add one to both damage stats of the friendly operative's ranged weapons. And they have the saturate rule, which means they don't get the extra um, retained save for cover. Whenever an operative is shooting a friendly mandrake operative that has one or more of your bale fire tokens, subtract one for both damage stats of that operative's ranged weapons. So basically, he powers up with bale fire. And then wreathe in bale fire for an AP. Select one operative visible to this operative that doesn't have a Balefire token until the start of this next operative's activation. Until it's incapacitated or uh, performs this action again, they get a get bit one of your Balefire tokens. So you can hand off Balefire tokens, and you can see here they have the, um, where is it, Balefire tokens. They have the, the Balefire tokens on the token set, which is the same token set that came in the old box. So if you have your token still from the Mandrakes that came in that box set, you'll be able to use these, and they all match. Then we have the Dirge Maw, uh, Bail Blast, same as the Warrior, same with the Glimmer Steel Blade, but he also has a horrifying scream. I like that they gave it the hair from the ring. It's the girl from the well <laughs> with the hair. Uh, the horrifying scream is five attacks, two plus, two, two damage, kind of a flamer. Range six, devastating two, so crits do two extra damage uh, with no saves, and then seek light, um, which means you're um, like uh, nullifying and, and, and making light terrain worse. Stun and soul strike. Uh, Soul Strike means you're going against APL. And Stun means that they're losing an APL if they take any damage. And then finally, Haunting Focus. So Strategic Gambit, you do this in the strategy phase. Select one enemy operative until the ready step of the next strategy phase. It gains a Haunting Focus token, which is one of these. Uh, it's literally the girl from the ring face. The next time your opponent activates an enemy operative that has a Haunting Focus token, if this operative is ready, you can interrupt that activation and activate this operative. If you do so during that activation, this operative must fight against or shoot against that enemy operative and cannot do so against any other operatives until it does so. If this is impossible, this operative's activation is canceled. After completing the activation, continue with their activation if possible. So basically, um, you're, you crawl out of the TV. So if they, if they go to activate that guy, you go, nope, I do something now, and then you take your whole activation because you're haunting them. And then periodelic projection. Select one enemy operative that's a valid target so that you can see. Um, for this operative, or is within shadow. So if one of the enemy operatives is within shadow, which means near a heavy terrain piece or underneath a vantage point, you can pick them too. Until the start of this operative's activation, it's, until it's incapacitated or until it performs this action again, whichever's first, worsen the hit stat of that enemy operative's weapons by one and subtract two from its move stats. So you're basically injuring it. In addition, that operative's uh, APL stat cannot be added to remove all positive APL stat changes it has. This operative cannot perform this action while it's in control range of the enemy unless the other enemy operative is within its control range or it's the selected action. So you can do it to somebody you're engaged with for an AP. So if you start in melee, you could uh, parry all projection it just to like freeze it and make it harder to hit you and then fight if you want. And then finally, the Shade Weaver, uh, which is our, um, like our caster of shadow portals, kind of our psyker. Uh, same core stats, Bale Blast and Glimmer Steel are the same as well. Shadow Portal, whenever this operative performs the reposition action using a Shadow Passage, you can use this rule. 
If you do, remove your shadow portal marker from the kill zone and replace one of your shadow portal markers with this operator's control range before it's removed and one with its control range after it's set up. So you leave one at the start of your move and the end of your move. Each friendly Mandrake operative can use a shadow passage each turn, uh, sorry, turning point, taking precedence over one operative per turning point if one of your shadow polar markers is within that operative's control range when it's removed and the other one when it's set up. Note that friendly operatives can do so even if this operative has been incapacitated and doing so doesn't prevent them from using shadow passage in the normal manner. And then Weave Darkness. Remove your Weave Darkness token right here um, from the kill zone. Uh, and if any, and then place your weave darkness marker visible to this operative or on a vantage train or a terrain feature visible to the operative. So you can put it like over a parapet on top of a, a piece of vantage terrain. That marker creates an area of smoke with the same size of the effect of a smoke grenade, except you don't remove it during the falling turning point. So it also counts as a smoke grenade. And smoke grenades are um, tech grenades, not tech grenades, utility grenades. Uh, and it goes a little something like this. Uh, so smoke, place one of your smoke grenade markers within six. It must be visible, uh, blah, blah, blah. The marker creates an area of smoke one inch high in limited heights, the same as this. In the ready step in the next strategy phase, roll a D3, remove that smoke marker, I don't think that happens here. But while an operative is wholly within an area of smoke, it's obscured to operatives more than two inches away, and vice versa. So you're gonna only be able to get normal hits against it, cancels all the crits, and you discard a shooting dice against it automatically. Um, ignore the piercing weapon rule if they're within two inches as well. Or unless they're within two inches as well. So super handy that you basically have like an, a one AP to place a smoke grenade wherever you want, and you can also use it for being within shadow and jumping too. And that's our specialist. So that's the, the core rules for the actual models. Not super different from the previous version, but then we have our faction equipment. And faction equipment is, with the exception of the two piece I just called out, so you're gonna know, need to know the smoke grenade rules for using your shadow portals, and also having the ability to place a heavy terrain piece for barricades would be handy too, but you could use your free one. The faction equipment's really good. The Vespids in particular, it's almost mandatory that you use the, the faction ones. They're, they've gotten a real glow up in this edition. Um, Chain Snare, whenever an enemy operative would perform the fallback action while it's in control range of a friendly Mandrake operative, if no other enemy operatives are within that friendly operative's control range, you can use this rule. So you have to be by yourself. If you do, roll 2d6 or 1d6 if the enemy has a higher wound stat than you. If any friendly uh, results 4+, plus, the enemy cannot perform this action and the AP is not spent. So you can't do this during the activation or counter action. You just can't run away. Um, which, again, is super handy because you're an ambushy melee army using the shadow portals and stuff and uh, being in shadow. Shadow Glyph, once per turning point, and these apply to everybody. Like, you don't hand these out to individuals mostly unless it says only once person per turn. So in this one, once per turning point, when a friendly Mandrake operative is activated within shadow, you can use this rule. If you do until the start of your next activation, while that operative has a conceal order and is in cover, it can't be selected as a valid target, taking precedence over all other rules, like vanished terrain. So you go Predator Invisible. Uh, and that's once per turn. So like you can just shadow glyph somebody and hand out a shadow glyph to somebody, which is this one right here. Um, and you just have somebody who's like, they're exposed, but you can't shoot them. They're just concealed. <laughs> uh, and then soul gem, once per turning point, when a friendly mandrake operative is performing the shoot action, you select a veil blast, you can use this rule and it gains the blast one special rule. So once per turning point, you have an exploding soul blast, which can be incredibly handy. And then finally bone darts, this is very cool also for being in um, concealment, which you want to be. Um, once per turning point, a friendly Mandrake can use the following ranged weapon. It's a bone dart, four attacks, three plus, two, four damage, range six, rending and silent. So if you crit, you upgrade another hit to a crit to do two, like eight damage total, and silent, you can do it while you're concealed. Because all of the other guns, soul strike, they're not silent, which means you have to go into engage to be able to use them. And then we have our token guide, and that's it. So really brutal melee attacks, because they've all got power weapons, the ability to take some silent shots, the ability to bamf around with your uh, tokens, and also to heal um, and to gain additional AP over the course of the turn. All of the firefight and strategic ploys go into that. This is a really aggro, up close, hard to shoot. You gotta have melee specialists to deal with these guys. They're not as flimsy as they look, because they've got eight wounds and the ability to build in some healing too. So an interesting aggro team with nine models total. Um, and just like the ultimate anti-armor. So if you're playing Space Marines, you're gonna be afraid of these guys because they effectively reduce your armor by one because everything is gonna be rolling under your APL stat. And if they take things like, it's pretty tempting actually to take stun grenades on these guys, your other utility grenade. Um, so taking that as an upgrade because stun grenades reduce the APL of what you're throwing it at. So if you were to throw stun grenades, let's grab out the utility grenades. For an AP, select one enemy operative visible to and within six of this operative. That operative and each other operative within one takes a stun test. For each operative to take the stun test, roll a d6 on a three plus, they're minus one APL. That's gonna go against, you can reduce a Space Marine's save to effectively only passing on a one or a two. And then, yeah, it's bad news bears because you're taking a ton of damage from that soul strike. 
uh, and you could do that for the rest of the turn. So you wait till someone's activated, stun them, and then just start throwing soul strikes at them and just grind them away. So a, a deceptively hard hitting and fairly numerous kill team with nine models. So there it is, the Mandrakes. Um, I'm pretty excited about these guys. They're gonna be fun to paint and again, not super complicated, like a pretty simple color scheme and they're very evil looking. They're gonna go, go well with my Halloween horror theme for kill team that's coming up pretty soon. And they'll make great NPOs as well actually, I think for the, um, the joint ops if I wanna write some missions, some like horror themed missions and stuff to play in this too. Uh, and that's it. So you can enjoy tons of other reviews of all eight of the card decks I got, the data cards, the additional data cards, so 10 total kill teams today. And also my reviews of Hivestorm, the Hivestorm dossier, the core rules, uh, and a Let's Play for Joint Operations, and the 2024 Approved Ops card pack. Uh, we'll be back next week with more kill team, but thanks for watching. Thanks to Ash.